My name is Mo Amir, and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bona fide culture and politics TV talk show right here on Check and Check Plus. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Tonight, we're going to focus on BC politics with a very special guest. You know him as the former BC cabinet minister who oversaw the BC ministries of deregulation, transportation and infrastructure, health services, and finance across his storied political career from 2001 to 2013. After nearly a decade away from elected office as a finance executive, who was also involved in several nonprofit organizations, he made his return to the BC legislature in May as the newly elected MLA for Vancouver Quilchenna. He's the leader of the official opposition in British Columbia, the leader of the BC Liberals as elected by his party earlier this year. He is Kevin Falcon. Kevin, so nice to see you. Thank you. What a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I've been a little hard on you over the last year. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but you're here, so yeah. I appreciate that. I oh, think that's a you. testament to your character. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like the biggest challenge you have as the leader of the BC Liberals is that you are now in charge of this big tent party yes. that historically has included federal liberal voters and federal conservative voters. Mm -hmm. And those two parties on a federal level are more divided than ever. Mm -hmm. And that chasm keeps widening. Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of bring everyone together when on a federal level, they seem to be in this culture war and really growing apart? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. You know, one of the reasons, the main reason, frankly, I came back to politics, because there's a lot of good reasons not to go into politics, quite <laughs> frankly, um, was because of my kids, right? I've got two young girls, 12 and nine, and I'm thinking about that generation. And I'm thinking about the kind of politics we're increasingly seeing around North America that is very divisive. It's about bringing people apart as opposed to together. And that worries me a lot. And so when I think about our party, the reason I keep talking about a big tent party mm -hmm. is because I want people to feel welcome in the party. And frankly, I think most people don't belong to a federal party. They're not, mm. you know, uh, liberals or conservatives or green or NDP. They're just folks that are working hard every day. And they're just looking for leadership that has competence and pragmatism. And that's really what I hope to bring to the table is just saying, like, let's just get some stuff done. Right. And not worry about the party labels and the ideologies. And so I you almost want to dispel this historical idea of that we're federal liberals and federal yeah. conservatives in one party. Yeah, I okay. really want to move beyond it because I, I really think that that's where the public is. And, yeah. and they don't care whether you're a conservative or a liberal. <laughs> they just they just care about like, what are you going to do for me? What, what are you going to do that's different? And will you get results? Right. So I want to go back to the B.C. liberal leadership race. And I want sure. to bring up two people in particular. The first is Aaron Gunn, sort mm -hmm. of the archetype conservative. Now, yeah. His leadership bid was disqualified. He was red lit, not allowed to run. Mm -hmm. He ended up leaving the party after that, but he did do work for the BC Liberals in the past. The second person is Val Litwin, who in my mind really does embody that sort of more moderate approach, a federal liberal type in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. He also left the party after losing his leadership bid mm -hmm. and he cited some personal issues with you. Mm -hmm. So my question for you is, as the leader of the BC Liberals, can the BC Liberals be a party where both a Aaron Gunn type and a Val Litwin type can coexist and find a political home? Yeah, you know, look, I I think the best way to answer that is to just look at my track record, for example. So, you know, when I did, I did lots of projects. So I'm thinking the, when I did the, what were called the Salome trials, where we were using an experiment, it was a trial mm -hmm. to try and help uh, heroin addicts get off of heroin by providing alternatives like hydromorphine. And the conservative government of the day was suing us, trying to stop us from right. doing this. And I said, no, we're going to go ahead with this because it's the right thing to do. We're trying to do evidence-based. What is the best way we can help out folks? Mm -hmm. Or another example is when I worked with um, Dr. Julio Montana uh, with HIV AIDS to come out with a project called Seek and Treat, $40 million to, to get into the hardest areas, the uh, high-risk prostitutes and drug addicts and help get them the medicine they need so that they're not going to be spreading H HIV AIDS mm -hmm. uh, in, in high risk communities. And, and those are, you know, things that I'm proud of, but they're not ideological. They're just pragmatic solutions. And that's how I think about people like Aaron Gunn and Val Litwin. At the end of the day, you know, I worked in a party that had Carol Taylor, 
uh, but it also had Richard Neufeld, which, you know, he was a strong conservative sure. reform type person. And she was a sort of a, a liberal. I don't know. I don't know what she was actually federally, <laughs> but she was pragmatic yeah. and and, uh, and responsible. And, and we worked together to just come up with solutions. You know, I worked with people like Mike Harcourt, a former NDP premier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we could see eye to eye in a whole bunch of things. Yeah. So, you know, that's just kind of how I am. I just like getting stuff done. So I appreciate your approach, but do you think this is a big challenge in terms of bringing people together? It is. It always has been. I think it is for most parties, honestly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, look, I mean, I, when we brought in North America's first revenue neutral carbon tax, it caused a big realignment because the NDP opposed us when we did that. They ran a campaign against it called Axe the Tax. But a lot of green voters came over and said, you know what? We like that kind of leadership. We want to get behind a government that is going to put forward those kind of, you know, important generational kind of decisions. And so, you know, is that ideological? I don't know. I just think it's the right thing to do. And I think if we do that, we'll get the right result because most people are pragmatic. Well, hey, Kevin, sit tight because okay. I have many more questions for okay. you. <laughs> Folks, stick around because after some business, we're going to discuss housing with our guest tonight, BC Liberal leader, Kevin Falcon. How much more housing supply can BC really build? And where do home prices need to be in order to be considered affordable? We'll get his thoughts up next. I'm Mo Amir. This is Van Cullen. Welcome back to This is Van Cullen. My name is Mo Amir, and we've been chatting with our featured guest tonight, the leader of the BC Liberal Party. He is Kevin Falcon. Kevin, thanks for sticking around. Of course, yeah. I meant to ask you this off the top. Is it yeah. Falcon or Falcon? You know, uh, it's Falcon. But, okay. But I, my I get both my ways. apologies. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. don't worry. People do it both ways, and I'm not sure there's necessarily the right way, to be honest. <laughs> now you can call me out on it. I think it like the bird, Falcon the bird. You yeah. Know, so there yeah, you go. Yeah. Okay. So BC Minister of Housing and yeah. Attorney General David Eby has recently shifted his position on housing, and mm -hmm. he's really focused on building more supply yeah. in the province. Yeah. He's talked about perhaps after municipal elections are over, the province intervening in municipal rezoning processes in order to build housing. That sounds really similar to your position yeah. of building more supply. So yeah. what is the difference between your position and David Eby's position? Well, you know, he's taken my position, which I don't mind in this case, because, um, uh, you know, I've been saying this since I launched my campaign over a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, because I've got some knowledge of the housing industry. Sure. You know, I came from that sector and, and uh, I've always said, wouldn't it be nice to have a premier that actually understands the housing sector so that we can actually properly diagnose the problem and then provide solutions that actually work? The problem with David Eby and his crew is they misdiagnosed the problem from right from the outset. At first, they said it was, you know, Chinese foreign buyers that were driving up prices. Frankly, that created a lot of anti-Asian racism because that's dog whistle for a lot of people out there that think, aha, now we know the victim or the, or, or the problem. It's, you know, those people that are driving up housing prices. When the stats show that's simply not the case, it's always less than 4% of foreign buyers actually, you know, in, in our marketplace. Then... They said, well, let's levy a whole bunch of taxes on the housing industry. That's going to solve affordability. And so they did. The whole blizzard of new taxes, too long a list to go through right now. But the point is, here we are almost six years later. They're in their second term. And we've got the highest housing prices in North America, third highest on the planet. Now and only now is he finally saying, gee, I wonder if maybe supply could be part of the solution. And I say, well, no kidding. If you'd talked to anybody that knew anything about housing, we would have said that right from the outset. Right. So here's my question. How much more housing supply can we actually build in BC? Because we do have record home starts and there's only a, a limited supply of labor, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need people to build these homes. Yes. And if you're an employer and you're out there, you know that it's very hard to recruit and hire people. So how do we, like, what is the capacity in terms of our potential? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, the capacity is always going to be stretched in the construction sector. There's no question about it. But the real problem is that, that you've got a bottleneck that, that restricts the ability to get new housing supply onto the marketplace. You've got you know, uh, communities and throughout the lower mainland and local governments that it is not uncommon that they'll take five, six years just to approve straightforward zoning processes. Um, you've got permitting processes that can take years to get through. So there's a huge amount of red tape and bureaucracy that's getting in the way, which is why I have said, and EB has echoed some of this, that I'm prepared to bring in legislation to make sure that we have timeliness so that we do get that supply into the marketplace. Look, it's important to understand that 
we need to flood the zone. We need all kinds of new houses. We need more townhomes, more condos, more market rental. We need more market affordable mm -hmm. uh, rental. Uh, we need more of everything. And if we do that, we will start to break the back of the affordability challenge. But right now, with a huge restriction in supply and increase in demand and 100,000 people moving into the lower mainland every year, we've got to have much more supply. And they've fumbled it, frankly. So I recently just bought a house, probably at the oh, peak of the market. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. When we talk about making housing affordable, yeah. clearly the other part of the equation is that home equities have to come down and yeah. the, the value of your home has to come down in order for other homes to be affordable. Mm -hmm. So based on your plan, how much equity am I going to lose on this new home purchase? Yeah, well, and prices may come down. I, frankly, I think with rising interest rates and the potential with inflation and rising interest rates, you know, um, it's, I'll tell you, we could be in for some, some challenging times ahead. And that will, that will on its own start to dampen uh, the accelerated overheated house market. I can assure you of that. Um, but look, I, you know, when I retired from public life in 2012, you know, a townhouse in Surrey, an average townhouse price would be about 450000 And today under the NDP, it's it's over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, back then it was affordable for a firefighter and a teacher to be able to afford a townhome. Now it's gotten really, really tough. So, But we can't bring prices no, back down no, to that no, level no, because a lot of people are going to be very upset, no, no, myself for included. Sure. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, it's not about wrecking the existing value uh, structure that we've got in place. It's about making sure that we can bring in a bunch of new supply and then think about how we can make look at the new housing through the lens of a first-time buyer like yourself if that was your first home. Mm -hmm. And that's where I've often said we need to look at all of the costs the government imposes, which is about 25% of the cost of housing today. It's all taxes. But those costs don't actually make up the sale price. Like the market demand determines what what a house goes for. It's not the input costs. Oh, right? no, those input costs all get passed along. Trust me. Oh, there's no They get doubt passed about along, it. but if there's no buyer... At, at that level, like you would just see construction slow down, wouldn't you? No, no. Like, so you got, this is the part the government doesn't get. If you keep imposing costs on developers, okay, mm -hmm. all developers do is pass those costs along in pricing. Now, if there's very limited competition, that benefits developers because then they can ask higher prices, get that, those dollars back, that they had those input costs back, plus make a return on their investment. But when you get lots more supply into housing, then there's a lot more competition. I can tell you, competition is the best thing for uh, trying to bring down housing prices. Because one thing developers do is they watch very carefully what their competitors are charging. Mm. When their competitors are dropping prices, 2000 or 3000 or $5,000 a unit, they respond very, very quickly because they do not want to lose those buyers to their you know competing developers. Sure. Last thing on the housing file that I want to ask you about is the BC speculation and vacancy tax. Yes. This is something you've kind of been talking about from the beginning when you launched your mm -hmm. BC leadership campaign. And the BC NDP have also been attacking you, saying that you're against this tax. And this tax is arguably the most popular tax in BC history. Mm -hmm. So I want you to set the record straight. Are sure. you supportive of this tax? Are you against this tax? Where do you stand on the spec tax? Sure, no, and I appreciate that because uh, the NDP say that, but it's not true. I've never said that I'm going to get rid of the speculation tax. What I have said is it's important for the public to understand that it actually has nothing to do with speculation. So they called it that because the name sounds good. But speculation is when you're buying and flipping properties and making, you know, uh, profits in a very short period of time. That's not what the speculation tax is about. The speculation tax is about charging people that own second homes uh, a fee for owning vacant them, homes, though, or in high demand. But, but that includes cabins and cottages on lakefronts, et cetera. And so, you know, they're going to be paying extra. So what I have said is that I want to look at the whole suite of costs and taxes that government imposes on housing, not just provincial government. But you, you've got GST, PST, property transfer taxes. You've got community amenity contributions, development cost charges. You've got public art charges. There's a whole list of costs that government imposes on the housing. And that represents about 25 percent of the cost of every new home and condo and townhome built today and so you know but those same politicians go out and say we are so concerned about affordable housing and yet they're a big part of the problem and that's all i'm saying is that i want to look at all those costs through the lens of a first-time buyer like you and say is that fair that they're paying all these costs when they're trying to get into the marketplace right okay we still have a little more before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, stick around. He's going to be here after a quick commercial break. Kevin Falcon will discuss diversity in politics up next. I'm Mo Amir. This is Van Culler.
Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir, and we've been chatting with the man who wants to be the Premier of British Columbia. He's the leader of the BC Liberal Party. He is Kevin Falcon. Kevin, it's been a pleasure so far. Thanks yeah, so much for being here. You bet. Great to be here. Have you heard of Mo Senior? Mo Senior? Yeah. No, I don't believe so. Okay, that is my dad. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so he immigrated here. He would be a, uh, he's always been a BC Liberal oh, supporter. Okay. All right. And he's kind of would fit in the party, you know, came here with nothing, yeah. made a big business for himself. Back in February, he gave me a call mm -hmm. and he told me that he heard this clip on Connect FM. It was an interview with right. you. And in the interview, you were asked about bringing in diverse candidates into the party. Yeah. And you said that you talked to people in the Chinese community, in the South Asian community, and that you were looking for the best candidates. Yes. But then what was kind of weird was you added this qualifying thing where you said, well, we don't want your unemployed brothers-in-law. Yeah. Mo Senior took a lot of offense to that. Mm -hmm. He told me that even though he has some problems with the BC NDP, he would never vote for the BC Liberals as long as you were the leader. Mm. What is your response to Mo Senior? Well, I'd have a conversation with them and, and look, you know, I would uh, maybe I was inarticulate in what I was trying to say. But what I was really saying is I want to make sure that we get the best and the brightest in this party running as candidates. And I don't care what community they come from, but I really want to make sure it's the best and that there's going to be no favoritism for whether it's friendship or patronage or any other th reason that people might think they can push someone on to me that should be a candidate that may not be as highly qualified as others. Mm -hmm. And that's really my whole point. Look, I, what I would say to Mo Senior is, um, you know, look at my background. Like I elected the very first South Asian ever in Surrey, a guy named Sergi Kuna to school board. And that was back when I was running Sook Dollywall for council, trying to get him elected. We were unsuccessful in that, that time, but uh, I'm proud of that. And, you know, my relationships in the community and both the Chinese community and the South Asian community, frankly, the Filipino everywhere has been long standing. And I tell you, I believe in making sure that we have not just a diverse party, but we find the best people to run for us. And I make no apologies for that, whether Caucasian, Filipino, South Asian, Chinese, I want the very best. And uh, I would I, I think I could bring your dad around if I get a chance <laughs> to talk to him. <laughs> you might have that opportunity. Do you see how maybe that comment, yeah. at least how, the way it came out, was hurtful or could feel condescending? Well, yes. I mean, if it did, I uh, I'd certainly apologize for that because it wasn't meant to be. I just really wanted to make the point that, you know, I am going to try very, very hard to get the very best. And I wanted people to understand because often you'll hear people will come to me and say, oh, well, we hear that, you know, because those people supported you now, they get to get, you know, their friends uh, as right. candidates and stuff. That does not work with Kevin Falcon. I say that to every group I speak to because I want everyone to understand that we are going to be nominating the best candidates we can possibly get mm -hmm. who happen to be South Asian or Chinese or Filipino or Caucasian. So let's talk about uh, diversity a little more. Sure. When we look at the current BC Liberal and we mm -hmm. look at all the BC Liberal MLAs, yeah. about three quarters of them are male yeah. and about 70% of them are white men. Yeah. Not a really diverse caucus, no. even though the BC Liberals historically have had more diverse yeah. caucuses. Yeah. I think every party can do a little better on that front. So how do you fix that? Well, and, you know, and what and what what's the core problem here with the current BC Liberal caucus? It's one of the reasons I'm running. You know, when I first ran in 2001, I guess I represented youth in yeah. the party, um, but we were extremely diverse. We had like a whole suite of South Asian MLAs and Chinese MLAs and gay MLAs and lots of women. It was a very diverse caucus, and frankly, we were a great caucus because of that diversity. I mean. People need to know that the reason I want diversity is because that's how you get the best outcomes. And there's just no doubt in my mind about so that. So where did the BC Liberals lose their way? I don't know, but they did, frankly. They did lose their way uh, because the caucus needs to be a lot more diverse than it is now. And look at my, when I put together my leadership campaign, I think I made it clear. I had, you know, an Arab as my campaign manager, Chinese as my communications manager. I had South Asians involved in key positions. Uh, and I had Caucasians. I had everyone. But the key is that you're going to get to a better result when you've got a good mix of people around the table. There's no doubt about that in my mind. It's been like that for me in the private sector and the public sector. The BC NDP have been quite successful in terms of recruiting very talented, diverse representation in caucus. Is there anything you would take from their strategy in terms of being able to recruit 
new people to the party? Uh, no, I, good for them. I think uh, I might quibble about the talented part, but uh, um, uh, there's some talent over there. Don't get me wrong. Look, at the end of the day, I think, you know, as I always say about the NDP, it, it, it's not that they're bad people. And I would argue they even mean well. It's just that they don't really know what they're doing in terms of getting big things done. And that speaks to the background. Um, having a background that you've been involved in running and managing large scale organizations is really helpful when you get into government. What we see happening right now, I think, is a direct result of, of them meaning well, but not knowing how to fix problems so that we are faced with, you know, decisions around museums that people don't understand why they're going ahead with billion dollar museums when we don't need them or highest gas prices in North America or highest housing prices in North America or high rents, or whatever the case may be. So that's why I think it's so important that we focus on getting great people to run in politics. Last question before I let you go, at least on this TV sure. part. A former colleague of yours at Anthem Capital mm -hmm. told me that you had a portrait of Ronald Reagan in your office. Yes. Is yeah. that true? It is true. We're confirming yes. rumors here on yes, This Is yes. Van Color. I you love know, it. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something, and I would encourage your audience, go, go Google the last speech he ever gave as president from the, from the Oval Office. And you'll hear him talking about bringing people together, talking about how immigrants built America, talking about inclusiveness and, and bringing people together. And he was a visionary that had a, you know, a, a really positive view of America and what's best about America. And then you contrast that to some of the leadership you're seeing in America right now. And you'll realize just why uh, there's a post a picture of Ronald Reagan in my office. <laughs> It'll tell you everything. You need. Are you going to bring that to the premier's office if you're there? Well, yeah, I certainly want to bring a positive <laughs> vision. And oh, and the, and the picture itself. Yeah, yeah. probably. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Mo. Folks, that was our featured guest for the night, the leader of BC's official opposition, the leader of the BC Liberals, and quite possibly the next Premier of British Columbia, Kevin Falcon. For more, be sure to check out This Is Van Color wherever you listen to your podcasts, as we're going to record some overtime with Kevin Falcon to discuss healthcare in this province, including the recent federal decision to decriminalize the personal possession of hard drugs in BC. But for now, that's our show for the week. Of course, we will be back next week right here on Check and the Check Plus app. This is Van Color, and I'm Mo Amir telling you that in a province where you can be anything, be colorful. Peace. <laughs>